Hi, my name is Uthgers, and this is my Global Studies Project. Both of my parents were born and brought up in India, where they were married before immigrating to the U.S. around 20 years ago. My dad is from Jaipur, and my mother is from Lucknow, which is where I went for the first leg of my journey. India is a land known for its traditions and heritage and distinctive culture. Much of the populace is still deeply connected to its collective past via religious customs that go back to some of the world's earliest human civilizations. It is also, however, known for its rapid change and progress, trying to scrape its way out of the third world category through westernization and technological advancements. You can tell you're in India the minute you step onto the streets and into the chaotic traffic. People swerve and weave through ceaselessly honking lines of cars and scooters and rickshaws and tempos, and the air is filled with the smell of street food being hawked from roadside stands and portable stalls. Inside almost every car you'll find a religious idol stuck to the dashboard, warding off the highest vehicular death rate in the world. This is where we stayed. The houses might look run down because they are. The street is over 60 years old, and renovations are just now being kick-started by the grandchildren of those who built it. One of the first things you might notice as you enter is the banner of Hindu swastikas hanging over the door, or the footprints of a goddess pointing inwards and inviting in prosperity and good luck. Religious paraphernalia lines the walls and bedecks a few choice tables in a few choice rooms. Over 80% of the Indian population identifies itself as Hindu. It's safe to say that this is what most average Indian families are centered around. Havans and pujas for success and thanks and veneration. Religious holidays, of which there are many, bring family together often if they aren't still living together under the same roof. Colleagues like these are sent from halfway across the world in recognition of shared familial and religious bonds, which connects to another major part of Indian life, family. Family isn't integral to every society, of course, but Western cultures mostly feature the nuclear family, whereas you can see by the size of most Indian homes that Indian culture emphasizes retaining close bonds with extended family. Things have been built and bought to last, to be worn out slowly over multiple generations. You can tell there are three families living this one home because the multiple cars in the driveway and the scooters park next to them. And you can feel the same sense of large, noisy community at school. There are an average of 60 to over 70 students per class in most Indian schools, and with the same class often staying from kindergarten to their final year of high school together, you can feel the familiarity and kinship amongst older classes just by observing them talk and rabble rouse during class or morning announcements. In these conversations, you'll hear snippets of dialogue from the latest Bollywood action films, but also conjecture about the future of the Harry Potter series and upcoming imports from Hollywood at the local multiplex. Westernization has left a very visible mark on India, which is no stranger to cultural assimilation. A simple thread for religious ceremony has, over the years, become a flashy day-long arm ornament, and mainly now an essential wedding ingredient, was taken from the Muslims. Nowadays, Indians are taking their cues from the all-powerful West, with formal sit-down pizza huts and English stamped shirts and jeans. I decided, for the second part of my venture, to explore one of these sources of cultural inspiration, England, specifically Birmingham. After a brief stay in the bustling metropolis of London, with its busy streets and physically manifest history and booming nightlife, we took a 90-minute train ride to the suburbs of Birmingham. On the manual car ride to our guest's home, you could see all the typical signs of Western civilization. Clearly marked lanes, traffic signals, attentive policemen, car parks, and malls. You'll see families at these malls, but they're new parents with their infant children. You don't see nearly as often as in India youngsters showing their grandparents, if somewhat begrudgingly, what a food court is. There, in fact, seems to be little in common between the two countries' youth cultures. Take a look at the school, for example, similar, for obvious reasons, to American schools. Small and well-equipped classrooms, manicured playing fields, and a liberal belief in universal tolerance. A far cry from the paper and pencil field squalor of Indian schools. With so little connecting India to Birmingham, I was interested to see how this immigrant family had chosen, if at all, to stay in touch with their roots. There were no Marathis in the driveway, and no decor to suggest any deep attachment to their eastern ancestry, 
other than perhaps a few eastern-looking pillows in the guest bedroom. You couldn't look at the red brick or the bay window or the metal furniture on the patio and tell that this was a family that had had to adapt at some point to new surroundings. Until, that is, you look about their sizable backyard. The Romanesque statues and roses and sundial were surrounded by vegetation that harkened back to the culinary roots of Rajasthan. Inside the automatic temper temperature-adjusting greenhouse was basil and chili peppers and mint, all carefully tended to and grown in order to throw into curries and chutneys. The cranberry tree maturing near the far end was being cultivated for the purpose of providing the wife with the snacks she frequently ate in her parents' home. They also had a small wooden puja ghar tucked away in the second floor room, from which, most mornings, the ringing of a bell could be heard, signifying the end of a prayer. While there didn't seem to be much of a way to keep the sense of community one can so easily stumble across in India, the English inner eyes I stayed with made it a point to not only appear to be fully adapted to British life, but also to keep strong, through religion and food, their ties to their motherland. Throughout our lives, we shape ourselves. We find ourselves through siphons of different colors, carefully measure and balance the labels we press over our skin. As we step into the light, we imagine it refracting into shapes that mark the edges of our shadows, changed only by the movement of our limbs. But so much of the angle at which these shadows are cast the funnels we choose, the people we are, is because of our childhood. My own childhood was one filled with religion and customs and grave moral lessons. My parents, both being immigrants, felt, as most immigrants do, a degree of guilt for having left the motherland and culture behind for the greater opportunities of America. This guilt resulted, as it usually does, in a rigorous education and maintenance of old customs and values. Every religious holiday was celebrated with great reverence and fanfare, with deers lighting every corner of the house and incense sending wafts of perfumed smoke throughout. Tied in with religion and tradition was family. Keeping in touch with our relatives in India is still a top priority. We visit as often as we can and call them. People the world over do the same, in an attempt to stay true and faithful to those who created them and built them up. In fact, such immigrants are oftentimes more precautious and conservative than their Eastern counterparts. India is all about progress and westernization and emulating the white man. I've learned through my travels and life experiences that the only thing to do is walk the middle path.